Hey guys, welcome back to FTD Speaks. Leroy Kenton here. And uh, Blogging Theology is a channel that I get a lot of links uh, to his videos for me to react to. And uh, here's one where he's talking about his experience of why he's no longer Christian. In this video, I just want to briefly explain why I am no longer a Christian. When I became a Christian uh, some years ago in my local Baptist church, not far from here, I became a born again evangelical Christian and I had a born again experience. In fact, I can tell you the exact date, uh, the month and the year that I uh, said the Jesus prayer and I be became a born again Christian and uh, many wonderful things happened. I had many uh, extraordinary experiences of a kind of spiritual, even supernatural kind. and. Um, but um, that wasn't the end of the story, of course. And what happened? Well, you know, I developed a powerful relationship with God. I became aware of the universe as a, a, div a creation of God, a divine creation. The scriptures, the Holy Bible, the Old and New Testament became very um, important to me. And they came alive to me in that way that they do for Christians. But also a parallel process starts to happen. And this was the Achilles heel of my faith and it was almost from the beginning because I took a great interest in the Bible of course and read it avidly and um, and with an expectation that God would speak to me and uh, I felt that God did uh, on occasions and uh, that it would be relevant to my life and I applied the Bible to uh, many problems and uh, it was great but at the same time I couldn't help but notice various things, various problem, problems, which I assumed at the time was the devil trying to undermine my trust in God's word. Hmm. And so I looked for solutions to these problems. And the way I did it was to think about them uh, to, and to turn to biblical commentaries written by Christians to help explain to me uh, you know, what the solution was and, uh, and thus overcome the problems and move forward. But it wasn't as simple as that. Yes, some of the problems did have solutions and I happily moved on. But others of them, I kind of dug myself into a deeper and deeper hole. And um, I discovered other problems because scholars would reference other issues. And I think, oh, my goodness me, I didn't know that was a problem. And that became an issue for me. Um, and as I said, I developed this parallel existence. On the one hand, I was a committed Christian. I believed Jesus was God. I believed in the Trinity, the incarnation, the atonement. I believed in the inerrancy of scripture. I was an evangelical, of course, Protestant, uh, conservative. And on the other hand, I was becoming aware through my own innocent reading of the New Testament, particularly of various big problems, which, as I said, like. I thought were spiritually um a spiritual in origin caused by the devil trying to undermine my faith i don't believe that anymore of course because these problems i was stumbling across are well known to biblical scholars and have been discussed by them for the last 150 200 years i just stumbled across issues which were well known in the world of biblical studies examples um, and of course unless there's some kind of massive satanic conspiracy you know in all the universities and seminaries in the world um you know this is these are real issues and i think of course they are real issues um what are they well there's a number of them uh, i'll just give you a, a couple of uh, examples and then oh, i'm going to read from a, a book by a leading um church of england priest a biblical scholar and dean of king's college here in london professor of biblical interpretation a very respected um scholar um, and he discusses uh, some of these issues in a very concise and helpful way just to share with you uh, what happened to me uh, when I also wrestled with these issues. And it led me ultimately to part company with many, not all, many of the fundamental teachings of Christianity, because I still believe a lot of Christianity is true. Um, uh, obviously, a belief in one God, belief in uh, the creation, the created order, that Jesus was the Messiah sent by God, the prophets, I believe, the day of judgment, I believe in angels and demons and, and the resurrection of the dead. And so the list is very long, actually. It's like a huge iceberg under the water. There's so much I still just accept as there. It's just a little bit on top, principally to do with things like incarnation, trinity and atonement, which 
I can no longer accept for historical and philosophical and theological reasons. So what were some of the issues? Well, I stumbled across, much to my horror in a way, uh, through my reading of the New Testament, the clear impression that many people, including Jesus, including Paul, James, John and others, expected the end of the world soon, very soon, imminently, within the lifetime of people then living. And um, I looked into this and tried to find a way to uh, reconcile this with the rather obvious fact that we are living 2,000 years later and the end hasn't come any time soon. And there's a prospect of endless millennia ahead. How can this be the case? There seems to be a mistake here made by Jesus and Paul and James and John, etc. Um, and the more I looked into this problem, it's called, uh, technically it's called eschatology uh, or the imminent parousia the more I realized that, in fact, there was a mistake, at least according to the scriptures uh, of the New Testament, that uh, uh, the way they spoke, Jesus is made to have made a mistake, and Paul clearly makes a mistake. Now, these are not uh, moral errors. They're not bad people because they made a mistake. Paul expected the end of the world. You know, he was wrong. He is a human being. He was wrong about many things, in fact. Um so that was one uh, serious issue. The other serious issue, which is kind of connected, is uh, the Gospels. Um, I discovered, and this is something that I didn't stumble across in my reading of the New Testament, but I learned and discovered through reading scholarship, biblical scholars. I discovered that the, the Gospel of John is seen as much less historical than the other three Gospels. And that's a real shame because the Gospel of John has some of the juiciest, most robust, most clear statements of Jesus' divinity anywhere in the New Testament, where Jesus says, according to John, I am the light of the world, or before Abraham was, I am, or I am the resurrection and the life, etc., etc. Now, all of these wonderful statements are only found in one Gospel, the very last to be written. They're not found anywhere else. And um, scholars are pretty unanimous with one or two exceptions across the whole world, the leading scholars, including Christian, most, most scholars are Christians, that Jesus, the actual historical Jesus 2,000 years ago, didn't say these things. And the reasons why are historical and, and textual and theological. I'm not going to go into them, but the fact is that is the case. And I was shocked to discover that was the case. Now, what did that mean to me? It meant that I, I felt that I could no longer rely on John, the Gospel of John, to give me the teaching of Jesus, the true historical, as it happened, as it really happened, teaching of Jesus. I felt that the experts, the historians, as I say, vast majority of whom are Christians, had taken the Gospel away from me, and I could hmm. no longer rely on it as reliable, as authentic. So that was... Uh, that was unfortunate. Um, now, there are other issues. I'm not going to go into them. But what they did was they, uh, the, 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 uh, the edifice of my Christian faith began to crack. And uh, the foundation, you know, basically started to crumble. Um, and my faith started to fall over. Uh, now, this is at the same time, of course, as a, being a believing Christian and believing all these doctrines of the inerrancy of Scripture, the deity of Christ, the atonement the incarnation the trinity father son holy spirit and all that perfection of the bible and i was discovering the bible was very imperfect that it contained errors and in fact some of the things i took as history and as true were perhaps not really history or true at least in terms of something that could be traced back to jesus so um i became increasingly schizophrenic if that's the right word on the one hand i was a went to church i believed i prayed on the other hand my faith was in crisis and it wasn't getting any better it was getting worse and worse and worse and i did study uh this at university uh as well and uh which didn't um help in some ways my faith my conservative faith but that's another story i'm not going to go into that so just want to share with you um some words from uh this book jesus now and then by Richard A. Burridge and Graham Gould. Now, Richard Burridge, uh, as I say, is Dean of King's College, one of the great theological colleges in Britain. Uh, he's professor of biblical interpretation. He's um, also a Church of England priest. He's a believing Christian. 
Uh, and he wrote this book with Gould, who is um, a lecturer also at King's College in Patristics, that is the early fathers. So they co-wrote this book. And I do recommend it, actually. You can get it uh, via Amazon and so on. And um, this is what they say. Um, and I have no reason to disagree with this. I, I, but I want to share with you, give you a flavour of how serious Christian committed top-notch biblical scholars and experts understand the historical basis for their Christian faith and the problems they see. They see this uh, and, and uh, you know, these are not enemies of Christianity. So uh, this is page 195. They write, to modern eyes, it is almost in inevitable that theologians, that the theologians of the early church will appear to have read scripture in a very naive way when they took it as evidence that Jesus was a divine person, become human, in other words, the incarnation. They took what to us seem like very vague hints in the Old Testament about the figure of the Messiah or the figure of wisdom, a personified quality of God in the Old Testament, notably the book of Proverbs, and interpreted these as evidence that the Old Testament authors actually foresaw in considerable detail the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. So what they're saying here is that these early theologians of the church, the bishops, uh, you know, whether it be Origen or Arrhenaeus or Tertullian or Justin Martyr, uh, quite, quite a few of these very well-known names, they mined the Old Testament for um, hints or evidence or proofs about the coming of Jesus, God on earth, the Messiah, the incarnation. Um, and alongside this prophetic proof of Jesus' status as God's son or Messiah, which is expounded, he says, for example, in the works of Justin and Origen, the church fathers set a range of information about him, his miracles, his teaching, his authority over demons and his power to forgive sins and erected it into what to them was very clear proof that he was a divine being. Even then they were not finished, for they took the New Testament hints about Jesus' pre-existence, for example in Colossians, Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verse 15, and the Gospel of John, 1, 1, and developed them with the aid of the Logos doctrine of, of Middle Platonist philosophy, into the fully-fledged doctrine of Jesus as God's creative Logos, which in the second century became the basis of the doctrines of the Trinity and Incarnation. Now, this is heavy historical theology. I'm not necessarily going to unpack it all here. Needs to say that the doctrine of the Trinity did not exist in the first century or the second century. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what predominated, I remember studying this at university, was this Logos theology in the second century. Logos is the Greek word meaning word, word. or reason. And it was identified as Jesus. This doctrine is heavily influenced by pagan philosophy, i.e. Plato's ideas, the, the Greek philosopher from the 5th century BC. They continue, modern readers of the Bible know much more than the writers of the early church could possibly have done about the type of literature that is contained in the Bible, about the nature of metaphor, about the way in which beliefs about the Messiah accumulated and the way in which Christian beliefs about Jesus developed over time including the period of the New Testament itself. So they're saying here that today, because of our awareness and sensitivity of genre, that's the sense of the different kinds of literature that exist, so we have to ask what kind of literature is this? Is it poetry? Is it a metaphor? Is it history? Is it a letter? Is it meant to be taken as uh, unvarnished reporting or is it highly interpreted and so on and so on we're now much more sensitive to these issues they say than the early fathers were and also the sense that the understanding of Jesus in the early church developed and changed it wasn't static from the beginning so they continue we are aware of how the New Testament presentation of Jesus was shaped by beliefs about him so that it cannot be used as a purely objective historical evidence hmm. for his life and status. 
So they're saying here, this is a commonplace in scholarship, that the beliefs of the writers, say of the Gospels, the beliefs that they had, shaped the way they spoke about Jesus. So the Gospels tell us as much really about the author's beliefs about Jesus as they do about Jesus out there as a person who they are describing. So they're not objective in the modern sense of being disinterested uh, accounts of a life. They are motivated by faith. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but we need to be aware of that when we read these texts and not just assume, perhaps naively, that they are giving us objective truth. So they continue and they give an example. For example, we know that some of the gospel statements that Jesus fulfilled prophecy and the events in his life that are alleged to have done so were probably created in the light of the belief that he was the Messiah and cannot be used as evidence to support the belief. For example, their example is the story of Jesus' flight into Egypt in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 to 15. Now, without going into all of what they're getting at here, uh, but I'll just very briefly mention for Matthew, it is commonly accepted, is presenting Jesus as a new Moses, as a second Moses. And so the gospel portrays Jesus in that way. So, uh, of course, who was it that gave a sermon uh, uh, that, that addressed Israel on Mount Sinai? Well, it was Moses. Who was it that addressed the crowds on the Sermon on the Mount? Well, it was the second Moses, Jesus. Who was it that went, uh, uh, who came out of Egypt uh, in the Exodus? That was Moses. Who came out of Egypt? It was Jesus. And there's so many parallels between Moses and Jesus and Moses and Jesus, which are uniquely found in this gospel. No other gospel, Luke, for example, does not have uh, Jesus going off to Egypt. Um, and this is, a, this he, he says, uh, these um, stories, well, the story of Jesus' flight into Egypt and then out of Egypt, again, uh, are probably created, they say, in the light of the belief that he was the Messiah and, but they don't say it, but a second Moses. So they continue, unless modern Christians are going to, to pretend that they live in the second or fourth century and to take scripture exactly as it was taken by the tradition prior to the Enlightenment, it is difficult to accept that there is as much historical basis in scripture for believing that Jesus was divine as the early church commonly thought. For this reason alone, the liberal project of refusing to be too dogmatic about claiming that Jesus was divine seems amply justified. Now, this extract is part of a, a chapter which is talking about modern understandings of Jesus and it's talking about how the liberal understanding of Jesus actually can help us to uh, sort out fact from fiction in the Gospels. Um, so I, I leave that there. But you, you see how uh, how dangerous this is if you are a fundamentalist Christian, because it really brings you up against the question of the historical uh, or unhistorical nature of the Gospels in the light of an intelligent, critical understanding of the texts. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So just to end it really here, because I could go on and on and on for hours like this. Um, a lot of what I believed as a Christian, I still believe. Uh, as I said, the iceberg is there. Vast areas of belief I still hold. In fact, most of what I believed, I still believe. But on certain crucial doctrines, crucial beliefs, I don't. I don't believe Jesus was Yahweh. Um, I don't believe it, that he was the incarnate son of God. I don't believe he was the second person of Trinity. And, I, and the idea of atonement, this idea of a human sacrifice or, or of any kind is necessary for God to forgive us and reconcile us, I think is totally unacceptable uh, on historical and moral and theological grounds. So I reject that now, uh, and I have obviously for some time. So that's why I'm no longer a Christian, but I suppose you could say I'm still half a Christian. And I, I, what I mean by that is I, I, the good things in Christianity I accept, the things I no longer believe in I don't accept, obviously. Hmm. Um, so that's for what it's worth, my story. And I must say that there are many, many people who can give a similar story. Uh, I, I know that the people who were with me in the first year class at university when I started to study Christianity, a Bachelor of Divinity degree, uh, University of London, I think most of us were conservative Christians, evangelicals, probably more and more Catholics as well. And I believe, I'm told, uh, that by the end of the course, 
uh, only one person was still evangelical or traditional at all. And even they were quite liberal because we had all been forced to face the facts, the historical facts, the literary facts, the archaeology, uh, the facts uh, of, uh, of biblical scholarship, what they have uncovered and shown us uh, about the scriptures and about historical theology, about the historical Jesus, about, well, you name it, it's a very long list. And um, that's why um, many of us, well, some of us lost our faith, some of us <clears> clung <throat> to bits of it. Um, anyway, but so there we go. That's why I'm no longer a Christian. Wow. Got a reaccount um, of his experience. Until next time. Yeah, as I was saying, that was a good recount of his experience. And, uh, you know, it was very good to just see his uh, train of thought from Christianity or what he believed to be Christianity anyways to what he believes now. And, you know, I'm probably not going to be the only person that is wondering this, but when we hear this term Christianity, we we think of a couple of things. OK, people that believe Jesus is God and that Jesus died for his sins, Jesus is the Messiah. And now we, you know, people do their best to live according to the the laws of God or the laws of Jesus, spread that good news that Jesus died for their sins. OK, so f for sure. All right. You know, anyone is entitled to their beliefs and anyone's entitled to believe and uh, share what they believe to be true. OK, but the point I'm trying to make is depending on the denomination that you go to, the definition of Christianity, it's going to change. It's like more of like a fluid um, belief system, you know, Christianity, follower of Christ. Well, what does that really mean anyways? And it's kind of hard to say, oh, I'm 100% a Christian. Okay, if you're 100% Christian, what areas are you actually following Jesus? And based on the text that you're looking at, okay, what is your, not only your interpretation of the text, but is this text saying something that is accurate? first thing you got to know did jesus actually do this did jesus actually say these things and then if you verify that and to your understanding and knowledge it's something that you trust okay well then what are you following and what does it fully mean to even follow jesus do the things that jesus did okay well let's go according to the bible anyways jesus healed people who among us is healing people like that you know jesus was raising the dead who among us is raising the dead you know he taught faith and said if you believe something and you don't doubt you shall have whatever you ask okay that's a highly developed mind that can actually do that faith is a form of creating something creating reality and without going too much into the metaphysics and the philosophy of it you know you got to ask yourself are you practicing that like faith that can't be shaken is that your practice is that your daily life to me that is what christianity would actually be like verifying what jesus said what he did what he didn't do and just following in line with that because you know we had dis he had disciples and a disciple is somebody that is trained by a master or a teacher and taught certain principles until they understand it and they live by those principles so according to the bible if jesus is training his disciples and those disciples are going and training more disciples are you then going out there and also training disciples as well as a christian or a follower of christ so just some questions pop up uh quite a bit of questions actually and i know blogging theology a lot of the changes that he went through when it came to his Christian belief had to do with the historical evidence of the various texts and certain logic behind the doctrines of like Trinity and uh, the atonement, you know, Jesus being a sacrifice to save humanity. And that's the only way to be forgiven by God and be accepted by God, you know, various things like that. But just like many people over time, he changed his mind. And I think it's very valid to change your opinion on things just based on the evidence that you've gained. And it's not something that should be silent. As a matter of fact, it should be something that is encouraged. You know, oftentimes people just say, you know, well, I was born a Christian Baptist. I'll die a Baptist. And that's their prerogative. 
And at the same time, it's like, okay, well, are you just now holding on to that belief because that's what you've been told and that's what you're the most comfortable with and uh, you're not really willing to see other perspectives? Or do you fully 100% believe what you're saying? Or are you just saying that because like that's what your parents said or your church community members said that? All right, guys, so uh, that's it for me in this episode. That's all I really wanted to say. Uh, let me know your thoughts and comments down below. If you did enjoy this video, which I'm sure you did, leave a like and uh, I'll catch you guys in another episode where we explore another topic relating to religion and spirituality. Later, guys.